1 verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. When a person hears the gospel and embraces Jesus Christ by faith, they are united with him and receive multiple benefits in this life and in the life to come. In other words, your salvation and mine is comprehensive. It is, and if we participate and partake in its many blessings, we do it for now and for the future, timely and timeless. Our best mother is timely and she's passing into timeless. But the revelation I have in my spirit, what I'm going to share with you today, if you live in both spaces now already, you already have the timeless as you are walking as pilgrims in the time. It is a revelation and it is a gift of justification that is unsurpassable. Because we now enjoy through justification, adoption, and sanctification, and various other benefits in this life and the one to come. So two of these blessings, justification and adoption, are singular acts of God's free grace. And the final blessing, sanctification, is an ongoing work of God's free grace. In other words, you can't be in or justified or adopted than you are once you have been united in Christ. And yet, you and I are perpetually and progressively being more sanctified once we have believed in Christ. This is the mystery. And uh, in the contemplative spiritual tradition, we, we love God as a God who is not always known. There is a mystery in that knowledge of God. The mysterium of God. And it is a wonderful place where we can move from asking the question, why? The same thing don't know. But where are you? And God comes out of the hiddenness and he shows you and me our own hiddenness and he shows you who you really are. So justification is a legal term and it means the issue of law and the question of a person's guilt are in view. For the same reason, it also means that he is a judge and a courtroom in the picture. So there's a kind of forensic audit being held about lives and sin. This is God's domain and this is God's business. And I very seldom like to talk about it. For you, as the pilgrims of Christ, you don't appear before the judgment seat of the sinner. It's a mystery. But you and I do appear before the seat of accountability in Greek it was called the Bema. It is a place not of judgment of sin but an apportionment of reward. So the mystery is while our sin is exposed there's no record of it. There's no metadata of your sin in it. That is extraordinary. And as we take communion today I'm going to refocus this is an expungement of sin. There is no record in the mind of God and in the consciousness of heaven of your sin. But there's something much more precious for you and for me. It is a record of the reward and what we've done for the Lord and for the kingdom of God. Because the left hand hasn't known what the right hand is doing. So this is really I'm not going to use the communion service, I won't go on too much. So I think this is the justification. Such a, an amazing gift. Jesus himself has expunged all legal action against you and against me for any sin that you may have perpetrated. Lovely, Anglican confession where it says, In penitence I confess for that which I have committed in omission and in commission against you, O Lord. So now we're going to look at the next piece of this theological puzzle is peace. It is the one thing 
that as human beings we crave. You know, you cannot live without peace. And when you have experience of living in discord with yourself, out of peace, out of sin, and you feel the emotional, psychological pain of that, it is a terrible burden. And when you live in relationships or in family, and there is no peace in the home, you also have that same pain and suffering. Timothy Keller, a great, wonderful preacher in New York, one of the greatest teachers in our age, he describes peace in the Greek shalom, and he says, he, this is his definition of shalom, he says, God created all things to be beautiful, harmonious, independent, knitted, webbed, webbed relationships to one another. Webbed relationships to one another. Just as rightly related physical elements form a cosmos, cosmos or tapestry, so rightly related human beings form a community. This interwovenness is what the Bible calls shalom, or harmonious peace. It means complete reconciliation, a state of the fullest flourishing in every dimension, physical, emotional, social, spiritual. Because all relationships are right, perfect, and filled with joy. Shalom is what humanity was created to experience. This is the pattern established in Genesis from the beginning. However, shalom is not always our reality. Instead of reconciliation, we experience separation. Instead of flourishing, we experience frustration. Instead of interwovenness, we experience brokenness. Shalom is not our reality because the fall is our reality. And I think this is why our gospel is called the good news, because Jesus restores shalom. You and I have a default setting. Outside of time, in the fullness of time, in the mysterium of God, he thought of you. He had an idea for you. And my friend his brother is passing from this dimension to the next today. She had a dream of her son a few days ago in which she saw him being given a white pedal with a new name of heaven on it. What an amazing gift for a mother to give a son. She told him, you have a new name in heaven written on a white pedal. And so we have this name, we have this identity, we have the assurance of being seated. This is your place at the table, the banqueting table. The wedding banqueting table is an amazing celebration and typology of being in heaven. You are unique. You know there's nobody in all of the universe that's like this. You're completely unique. That's why we have a unique DNA. We have unique fingerprints. We have uniqueness about us. And that is what makes us so extraordinarily valuable. And when you're working, when you're doing spiritual formation, and direction, unless you have a sense of the value of the person, you're going to get entangled and you're going to get entrapped in all the problems and all the brokenness of where the act and the time lead and you miss the big revelation of kindness. So, what is your reality of Shalom? And what is mine? So, so I'm going to maybe share some personal reflections. Uh, the reason, possibly, I recently celebrated my commitment to Christ as a student. Uh, my wife and I were Rose, and on the 11th of October 1987, I made a commitment. I was a student at St. Andrew's Prep, and we had a fellow student who was a very gifted evangelist. And he would read my poetry and he would say, Ooh, mm, you're searching for God and you're searching for this. And, and he was very skilled in capturing through the scripture, he captured something in me that was supernatural. So I went from being, I'd always been on God's little boat, 
we have Catholics, uh, I was an altar boy, and I always experienced the conscious beauty and the magnificence of God in the sacraments, in the liturgy. But I didn't get that clear gospel presentation, the conviction of sin, the need for personal repentance and taking responsibility. It got mushy. And so I needed to have that clarity of you need to make a personal commitment and say, I'm simple. You know, I don't know for sure, and I've got a lot of problems with scripture and the word of God, and we are issues. And you know how the church conducts itself and how Christian leaders pitch up, there are lots of issues. But I've got to settle once and for all to make a choice, a commitment. And I think when I've been with people at their deathbed, you know, it's as if the exhaustion of the debate is gone. And all that matters is what was the choice. And I think that is what is so critical. So, quite recently, I took seven groups through spiritual formation, and we call it the rule of life. The word rule comes from the lattice, it's how the vine can grow. And the idea of a rule of life is that you and I, while we are before the foundation of the world, uh, we are separated and consecrated to God. And then in time we get the appropriation, this appropriation of that is now defined. And in the mystery of God, we don't quite know how this works, we are reconciled to Christ and to our creation intent. And so what you now have is you've got this incredible gift of creation intent, balancing earthly lament. And you've got to have both, otherwise you're out of tilt, you see? And so I wanted this method of living in the presence of Christ, in the now, in the moment. So like the steep cusp, you go from one crisis, one thing, God waits for you, Jehovah Shammah waits, and you go into the situation and you have everything you need, you call his presence. So, at a neurological level, the amygdala in your brain is open because you feel safe in this trust and you can embrace life and you can experience that co-creation with the Holy Spirit, the imagination of God for life. But to live in the now, you also have to live in the day. And because Christ has purchased your time, you are now held in eternal, eternal life in this wonderful dance between timely and timeless, your consciousness of your creativeness and the management of your earthly lament. Incredible. The truth and the reality of God's love, where we are, is what brings us out of hiddenness to embrace the Messiah who says, I see you. I don't just see you where you at, I see through you because I knew you in the fullness of time and I'm standing in the throne room to the sea for you right now. What an incredible privilege to be loved like that. And so we did the seven formations and I thought I was going to come out there amazing, uh, you know, I'm going to have my own rule of life, I'm going to live this uh, wonderful life of, of being in the presence, kind of neurological ecstasy where you feel the intimacy of Christ, the connection. But that hasn't been the case. I don't really have the full sense of heaven. I don't really have a full sense of myself in timelessness. And I really feel quite stuck in timeliness. And the Holy Spirit is now offense, and I haven't had a complaint. And we kind of talk about me together and say, how are you doing? And I feel the Holy Spirit saying, not so well, how are you doing? No, I'm not doing well either. The kind of conspiratorial friendship with the Holy Spirit in saying, you need self-awareness, self-management, and a level of some spiritual mastery. Because you need to mature. At some point, you've got to stop pitching up like a toddler. Whining, you know, me, myself, and I, woe to me, and you've got to be mature, you've got to enter into this 
discipleship of being a pilgrim that is hard, resilient, able to carry the burden of love. That is really quite significant. So, I just want to make some thoughts as about panic. I don't know many people that don't have some level of physical pain, psychological, emotional, or spiritual. I'm going to say pain is not the problem. Pain is intelligence, follow it. It will take you somewhere significant. The problem with pain is when it buffers and it doesn't get managed, and we don't, we become fearful of it. Right? The same is true of suffering. At its best, suffering is the place of dissonance. It holds the gap between heaven and earth, between your creativeness and your earthliness, between your calm and your spiritual, between your reality of your real you, your inner thoughts, your inner imaginary world, your real desires, your little doos and dummies and blankies that you comfort, with the magnificent you, with the fullness of the divine image in you, unique. And with that gap, that massive dissonance, that gap is the place of huge suffering. But it offers the grace, it is our place of intercession. And we hold it. So, if we can allow suffering to be our place of prayer and intercession, then it has meaning and we can at least address the suffering that we're in. So that brings us to Isaiah 33. So the last time I preached was on Isaiah 33, and I couldn't, can't help coming back because it's staying with me and it won't leave me. So, Isaiah is prophesying on three levels. Stay to the people in the time you are at risk. You have a powerful enemy, the Assyrians, and unless you turn to the Lord who loves you and let him protect you, you are at risk of being taken into exile. But he's saying that at the level that has got a Christology to it. And then in another level, as eschatological. And so he says, says, you need to, your, your tackle is loose. That's the ropes on the mast. They could not strengthen the mast. They could not spread the sail. And this is what I want to share with you today. That you and I, we, need to attend to our boss. What is your worldview on how do you understand the gospel? Vertical? How do you understand who you really are? Timely and timeless? How do you understand the people around you? Are you trapped in what you believe about them? Or are you open to let God speak to you about what He believes. We also, in the crisis, because we have powerful enemies in the land, if you have any insight into the enormous catastrophic risk of ESCOM and our debt in the country, we have reason to be shaken. But, just as Isaiah was prophesying in his day, there's a blessing on our land and there's a blessing on our people. And we need to let the Lord love us. But there's an eschatological gap where Isaiah is saying the oarsman cannot take the boat across the other side. Your labor will not get you there. You need to loose your tackle, set your sails, and let the wind take you across. And this is, I think, where we are at. You and I, the bottom of the mast, we find ourselves in our humanness. You have epigenetics. You have a history. There's been trauma. 
There has been a history of betrayal, rejection, injustice. There's things that have been done against us. There's things that we've done. We have a personality. Sometimes we struggle with mental illness. Things are not always clear. And we are in distress. But that is not the only place that we need Christ. Because surely that is the one place that you must ask him. We find him at the top of the mast, with the intent for our lives, who you really are, and we must tighten the sail for the belief that we are loved. We are known, we are called, set apart, consecrated from the very beginning. And then you tighten the sail along with the boom, the vertical, now the horizontal gospel of social impact in our kingdom, in the kingdom, in the nation, in the city, in our church, in our community, in our neighborhood, in our family, in our household. Tighten the loose riggings when we are at. And now the sail is tightened on the moss and the boom, at the bottom, at the top, and along the side, and now we wait. And so this is this is where I am at. I'm waiting. So I believe that every single day is forgiveness. You cannot walk in this dimension of time without the practice of daily forgiveness. You ask and you give. Most importantly, you have to forgive yourself. Because you are not the one forming yourself, you are being formed by the potter, and you need to let his hands work with you, and you need to surrender forgiving yourself to him. It is critical. Then, the other bracket is gratitude. So you and I need to be forgiving every day and grateful for everything. That is our obligation. In between the brackets, we have a cross. And I don't know how to say this, but the cross is never going to be glamorous, it's always going to be a piercing. And though we find the Messiah there, we find ourselves also on that cross. We find the piercing, and you can have the wounds on you to show you have experienced that. That is the inevitable journey of the pilgrimage. And then there is the two. We find ourselves in perpetual grief. We are always losing something. The biggest grief, and it's existential, is the grief of loss of innocence. Because you have deep down in you a consciousness of holiness, and you've lost it. You have a consciousness of perfection and you don't have it. You have a deep consciousness of peace and shalom that is so deep, it's ecstatic, but we don't have it. There is no sin, there is no sickness, there is nothing that goes rotten or is broken. We have within us that intuitive sense of that exists already. So, now we live in the real world, and the gap is there and is lost. So, you know, grieving has different cycles, and for different people, they vary. It is always a risk, a refusal to accept that you grieve is a loss. And you're angry. That does have that. Then there's depression. You can be in the depression for a long time. You might be help to get out of that. And that is one of my biggest regrets, is that I did not have enough knowledge of the of psychology and psychiatry to help and to help other people. I think our family would have been in a very difficult, different place if we had more knowledge. So I think that is quite critical. And then you come out of the depression, you manage, you reframe, you use that Victor Franklin's concept of making meaning into suffering, and then you transform. But the transformation happens 
only with the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that was able to put Christ in Mary, the same power that gave him the grace to hang on the cross, the same power that put him out of the tomb, is the power that you and I need. It is a moment by moment, day by day, month by month, year by year, abiding and dwelling hunger and openness, Lord, will you build as a sanctuary and a place of preference for you. So that's it. It is a big task, and I don't know how you're going to do that other than be very intentional about a rule of life for yourself and to change the language. But you are going to need to take your time in your day and be very intentional about the practice the presence of Christ in His Word, both in the reading of the Word and the studying of the Word, in prayer. And I love the Thomas Burton and uh, Simon Bale's concept. Prayer is not just telling God what He knows. Prayer is an ability to be attentive to where He looks. What is he touching? What is he feeling? That sensitivity to prayer is what makes for an amazing existence and partnership and fellowship with God. And then you have the week. Sabbath keeping is not something that's optional. We depend upon it. Unless the Lord builds the house, the labor is laid in vain. Your work is your worship. And then you'll hear how you celebrate your death, the intentionality of will you practice a liturgical year, a biblical a Jewish calendar, it doesn't matter how you integrate that, that is quite critical. And then sabbatical rest, how do you prepare for the resting in your life, living the land like fellow, and how are you preparing for Jubilee? So, the Jubilee is quite important because it's a departure line before we go to the next. And I always have this image of my daughter when she just began to travel, she had lots of luggage. And we get bounced as we get to the check-in because we knew that we'd have to take things out. One day she had about two kilograms of bath salt that looked like her hands. So, in any event, she's not traveling much like that. But if you need to get rid of things in your life right now, the things that are not helpful, that are not necessary, you need to forgive. You need to write letters, you need to let things go, because you cannot arrive at the checking line with these big steel tools. I mean, the checking line is going to sound sorry. It's embarrassing because all the people standing around you, I'm going to leave all these problems behind. And then you take all your precious jewels and things that are important to you, and you put them in the carry bag, get on the plane, and arrive in heaven, and then this. This big sanctuary angel reach and says, You know, you can't take it with you. In the whole furnace, it's quite well used, and all the things you think are precious and valuable, but it's quite a thing to go only with very few things to the other side. And that's where the crowns that are given and distributed by the demon, Jesus giving you that. So, a strategic level. If you want to love people in your family, prepare them to travel light so that they don't go for things and they don't spend your time on things that are better. Just take communion and let us then take what you're learning and let us experience the freedom of forgiveness. Let us reset the te- default setting to that, for that is the gift of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us proclaim together, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out of your
the Holy Spirit upon us and upon these old gifts of bread and wine, that the bread that we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in the ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us. As this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the church. Unite us now at your table, and in one loaf and a common cup, make us one in Christ Jesus. Let your spirit empower the life we share, and ignite our witness in the world. With all who have gone before us, keep us faithful to the gospel teachings and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. Give us faith to serve you until the promised day of the resurrection, and with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast and be with you at your table in glory. To Christ, all glory and honor are yours. Almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. As we drink from the cup, we drink from the cup of suffering. May your suffering, which you experience, be put under the blood of the Lamb. And may you experience the freedom that comes from being one with the Lord. Receive the sacrament, live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may know, that we may show forth your gifts in all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are now sing the Lord's Prayer. You can say it. There we go. <laughs> our Father, we try to return. Hello, we die. Amen. Thank you. 